in five years. He just turned four years old on April the 8th. His horns will continue to grow till the day that he dies. But from five years on, they grow very slow. So he's grown this amount of horn in four years. Okay? Now, he was born April the 8th. His younger brother was born on the 15th, but his younger brother stands up to here. He weighs 2,000 pounds. This guy only weighs about 1,400. Now, they are, because of the way he is, I, we're not going to call him a wild animal, and he's definitely not a, train, a tame animal. Okay? But he is trained. He's trained to put on programs like this for you, to be ridden like a horse, to go in parades and do things like this. Yes, we ride them. There's three of them, okay? My purpose in having Longhorns, having taught Texas history for so long, I wanted to bring a Longhorn to school so that you understand if six of you were to take a thousand of these and try to walk them up to Kansas, what it would be like. Okay? Now, let me tell you this. Sixty billion dollars is what the beef industry is worth to the United States in a year. Sixty billion. Okay? Now, there are 51 breeds of cattle that make up that sixty billion dollars. Okay? Now, do you understand what I'm saying when I say breeds? Like, let's take breeds of dogs. A Yorkie, a Lab, a Schnauzer, a Doberman, a German Shepherd. These are all breeds of cattle. Uh, excuse me, dogs. Breeds of cattle are Longhorn, Hereford, Simmental, Red Angus, Black Angus, Brangus. There's 51 of them. He's one of the 51 that's worth $60 billion. Now I'm going to pick on a few of you to give you a number. How many breeds of that 51 do you believe are native to the United States? Just give me a number between up to 51. 30. That's a good number to start with. How about you? Huh? She's going in the right direction. That's going the wrong direction. She said 10, so it's got to be less than 10. How many? Huh? Getting real close. You're going the wrong way. Zero? <laughs> That's correct. Zero. Zero. $60 billion worth of beef are made up of cattle that came from immigrant families. Now, I just want to look at you, and I don't see in the standard facial features of a Native American Indian, okay? So that means all of us came from someplace else in our ancestry. I mean, my great-great-grandparents came from Germany. They didn't speak English, okay? They came and they had kids and then they had kids and I hit here. So what's pretty neat, when you look at it, every breed of cattle, every type of person, their ancestry came from another country. Okay? So we're all a bunch of people just like these are. Okay? Now, let's look at where this guy came from. He actually started in Spain, or at least as far as we're concerned. The first cowboy ever put on record's name was Christopher Columbus, because he brought cattle from Spain to the New World. He brought a few head over, and then the missionaries started bringing a few head over, and in just 200 years, so about 1693, there were hundreds of these roaming all over Mexico and part of Texas. Okay? 
so they were multiplying and surviving. Now, there's four reasons that are very important why they were able to survive and thrive all of these years. First off, they eat anything, any kind of grass, any kind of weed. In fact, all of my trees at my place are trimmed up nice and high like those are, not because I go out and trim them, it's because they trim them for me. During lunch, I went over there to a tree and he saw these little limbs hanging close to the ground. He got after it, man. They eat anything. They'll even eat cactus. Okay. Second of all, they can go long periods of time without water. Now that doesn't mean an hour or two like we want to go to. I'm talking about days, sometimes weeks they can go without water and survive and thrive. Next thing is they can survive in any type of climate. A cold climate, a hot climate, a dry climate, a wet climate. They survive and reproduce. Now, if you're a cattle man, the only way you make money is for your bull and your cow to have a baby, you sell a baby, and you keep on going like that, and you're able to make money. Okay? That's how you make it. Now, this is what's unique about the Longhorn. 99% of the time, they can naturally give birth to a calf on their own and it is healthy. In other words, in five minutes, they're standing on their own feet and learning how to nurse. Okay? Other breeds of cattle are. I just learned this two weeks ago that the Hereford, a big brand of cattle, a breed of cattle, has a 70% success rate. It means 30% of the time they have to have some help. Now, let me explain to you about help. Sometimes, a baby is too big or somehow it's crooked within the birth canal and the mother cannot naturally have the baby. Most of the time it has to do with the leg it's crooked and it's stopping from coming out the birth canal. So what the cowboy, the rancher, I've done it, it's been done over all the time, there's cattle. What you have to do is reach inside the mother's birth canal up to your elbows and see if you can find something that's out of place. Most of the time it's a leg. So what you do is with your hands you grab this leg and try to straighten it out so that it's pointing out in front. And you step back and wait a very short time to see if mother now can birth the baby. If she can't, you got to move because if the baby dies inside the mother you can't get it out, the mother's going to die. You're losing money. So what you have to do is stick your hands back in the birth canal, this time with a rope. You tie it around the front feet of the calf, then step back, and when the mother pushes, you pull. And it's called pulling a calf. Because that's the only way that you can save both of them. But look at it this way. Nine times out of ten, they don't need help. Other breeds of cattle, seven times out of ten, they don't need help. So if I'm going to raise cattle for money, I want something that can have their baby out in the field all by themselves. Okay, four important things about them. It's helping you to understand how they started with four or six and turned to hundreds. And then by the time of the Civil War, there were millions of these guys roaming all over what we call Mexico and what we call Texas. They're wild. Now, to be exact, there's more of these guys in Texas than there are people. That's how it was. Yeah, that's the part of it. Now, Civil War, I consider to be a very sad time in the life of our country. I have studied, you have studied, I've read all the causes that really, when someone says, what caused the Civil War, there's a reason. But what's difficult for me to comprehend is that whatever that reason is, what would make a father fight his sons on opposite sides? What would cause an uncle to fight nephew on opposite sides? It just didn't make sense. But right before the Civil War and during the early beginning of it, 
we started making in Texas a lot of money because we were moving these things straight to the east and selling it to the Confederacy. We made some money selling Longhorns to the Confederate Army. But then the Union Army came along and put a block on that. We no longer could send cattle to the south. We were stuck. We had lots of it. Now the point was that this time, we don't have any money in Texas. Nobody had a job. So the men saddled up their horses and they went to join the army, whether it's the south or the north, and that way they had a job. Now, let me be honest with all you ladies. If it wasn't for the ladies of Texas back then, I don't know where we'd have been at. Because the man was gone. The mother took care of the crops, gathered the crops. She fixed the meal. She washed the clothes. She made the clothes. They gathered the eggs. She homeschooled the children. She was doctor, nurse, and teacher. Those ladies of Texas kept life moving. Wasn't making any money, but they were making life moving. Now, when a war is over, soldiers come back looking for jobs, just like they do today. Well, soldiers came back from the Civil War. There's no money in Texas, no stores. You didn't have money to buy. Stores didn't have money to buy. So, zero economy. But what did we have in Texas? Longhorns, millions of them. Now, those folks up in the Northeast, Chicago and New York, they wanted meat to eat, okay? They wanted meat. Now, they've got dairy cows, but that's not a, a meat you eat, okay? It's a dairy cow. So they made an offer. They said, hey, Texas, if you can get your cattle to Chicago, we'll buy them for $28 a head. That sounds like a great deal. The problem is this. We couldn't get cattle to Chicago, okay? But you're going to study a term, might have already, it's called westward expansion. What that means, the United States started on the east coast of the nation, and it started expanding to the west, all the way to the west coast. And the best indication or sign of progress in civilization was the railroad. So the railroad started up here in New York, Chicago, and started coming right across the middle of the United States. And it got up here to the states of Kansas, Dodge City, Kansas, Abilene, so on. And then the railroad looked at Texas and said, you know, cowboys, get your beef dust here in Kansas, we'll buy them for $15 a piece. Okay? Now, you pretty good at math. Let's say you got a thousand head of longhorns, okay? And you walk them up to Kansas City and you sell them for fifteen dollars a piece. How much money are you making? Fifteen times a thousand. Fifteen thousand dollars. Now, let me tell you, in those days, I was rich, okay? But let's say you didn't want to go out and gather these wild things. You wanted to pay some old cowboy like me to go out and gather them. So I charge you four dollars a head. So you got a thousand cows, and I'm going to charge you how much? Four dollars a head. Four thousand. Four thousand. Okay. But you're going to sell them for how much? Fifteen. So four from fifteen is what? Four from fifteen. 11. She's still making $11,000. Okay? That's great <laughs> money. The problem is, we were making great money because we had an open range which meant no fencing. You could just walk your cows over. Here's the problem. Some people in Oklahoma and in Kansas certain areas of Texas didn't want to be cattlemen, they wanted to be farmers. Okay? Now, I need a good farmer. Farmer. How about you, right there? Come here, young man. Right there in the red shirt, looking all around. 
Okay, come on. Oh, come on over here. Stand right there. Okay, look at me. All of this land is yours. Okay, and you've got crops planted, corn, wheat, oats, all this stuff. Okay, now you're going to sell some of those, but you're going to eat some of them, right? Now, what do you think is going to happen to all your land if I bring a thousand of these guys into your land? eat the crop, they're going to destroy the crop. Is that going to make you happy? It's going to make you sad? Yeah, it's going to make you mad. Now, what could you do to keep people and cows out of your property? What could you build? He's right. Barbed wire, that's our second step. The first thing they could do is build a fence. So all these brilliant farmers built a fence out of this kind of stuff. It's called smooth wire. Feel that thing. Okay? Grab a hold of it with two hands, wherever you want to. Can you bend it? Bend it. Right now look. If you can take this wire and bend it like this, what do you think a thousand ahead of these guys could do to it? Destroy it. Okay? But I have to tell you, there's this old boy by the name of Joseph Glidden. And he invented a thing that they first called devil rope. The name is actually barbed wire. I can't tell you what I've called it a lot, okay? You see the wire right here? Feel it. That's smooth. It's kind of like two of those pieces of wire, isn't it? They took, Joseph took two smooth wires, twisted around, but then he put these little, yeah, on the end of now, let me show you why the cattlemen hated farmers' fences made out of this. Now, hook up sides about a quarter of an inch thick, okay? He thinks I'm scratching his back. His belly's about that thick, too, that high. He's okay with that. But you know that skin down here on the front of his leg? is just like the skin on the front of your leg. It's very, very thin. Okay? Now, what do you think is going to happen when the farmer builds a fence to this and my cattle try to walk through it? What's going to happen to the cattle? Get injured. If we can't treat the injury, what's going to happen to the injuries? Yeah, eventually they're going to die. Now, if I make money by selling these things live, I don't like this stuff. Okay? So here we go. Remember, you own this property. Okay? And you got your big old barbed wire fence built. Okay? And I come up with my herd and we're stopped here. Hey, partner, how you doing today? You doing all right? You, you live around these parts? Yeah, yeah. Tell me. Son of a gun that built this barbed wire fence. You do. Could you give me his name? <laughs> Malachi. Did you build this fence? Let me tell you about this, partner. I got three little boys back at home, okay? And a wife. And the only way I could put food on the table and buy some things for them is I gotta take these guys right through your property on up there to Kansas. You understand that? If I can't do that, what's gonna have my poor little three little boys? Now, did that make you feel good? No. But what are you protecting? He's protecting his crops. He's defending his way of life and how he makes money. I'm doing the same thing. So here's what happened. Cowboys have come up, cut this wire down, and start driving the crop, the cattle through it. Now, guns would start firing, shooting them up in the air to drive the cattle, or him shooting them up in the air to drive the cattle back. But somebody started thinking, hey, maybe they're shooting at us. So the cowboys start shooting at the farmer, the farmer starts shooting at us. 
And what we had, people, can you believe this? People lost their life over cutting a fence. And then the federal government passed a law that said it's a felony to cut somebody else's fence. Okay? And those were called the fence cutting wards. You did fine there, sir. You're a good farmer. Now, let's look at this. Cattle drives were successful because we had an open range. But then this invention came about and it changed the open range to what kind of range? Opposite of open, closed. closed. Which means we couldn't drive our cattle up there. But if you remember that railroad coming across the middle of the United States, came up here into Kansas, well, took a left-hand turn and it came down right over here at Fort Worth. Now, because there was more cattle men in Texas and more cattle than people, Texas cattlemen could drive their herds to Fort Worth and sell them. So the money was coming in again. Okay? We good with that? Now I need three good longhorn owners. Okay, come up here. You're one. I want you to remember that you have 301 longhorn. Okay? You have 300. Okay? You have 299. Okay? You all put them in a herd together and you drove them over to Fort Worth. Okay? Now they all look like football. Okay? And I'm going to be the cattle buyer. Okay? Say, partner, how many of these uh, head of these uh, muleys here uh, do you own? Uh, 301. Could you pick yours out for me? Uh, huh. Oh, ma'am, how many you own? 300. Can you pick yours out for me? No. You must be the smart one. How many you own? Aha. Uh -huh. Can you pick yours out? You know, it's been funny. I have students all periods long and every day the same questions. And all of them seem to be in the choir. They always say, uh, mm. Nobody knows. See, I can call you my name. But I don't have a nice job. What you had to do was you had to brand them. Now this is a branding iron. It's our branding iron. It's what we use. It's made out of the same material, the same length, everything as the old cowboys did. Now, I'm going to tell you the definition of a brand twice so that you understand what it means. But it comes down to this. Remember the last two words. Okay? A brand is a physical mark of ownership on a piece of property. A brand is a physical mark of ownership on a piece of property. Okay? Now, the way they would brand the head of cattle is that they would lay this brand in a very, very hot fire, campfire. And they'd leave it there until the brand got red hot. The whole bottom is glowing red. Well, they'd go rope one of these little guys that's less than a year old, pull him in the corral, flip him on his side. First cowboy would lean on his neck and cut a notch in his ear. Because that, that's a physical mark, okay? second cowboy would grab one leg as he's laying on the ground and stretch it, keep from kicking. Third cowboy might do a little minor surgery on the back of the cow. And the fourth cowboy would come over and get this red hot, red hot piece, and they'd come over here and they'd press it hard. One, two, three, four. What he did was kill the hair, kill the hair follicle, and form a huge scar. It's a permanent mark. Okay? Now you can see some outlines here of his brand. The hair has grown over it. It hadn't grown out of it. Boy, you can feel the big scars underneath. Okay? Now, you remember when I said Civil War was a very sad time in our life? Okay? You're not going to believe this. Prior to the Civil War, Hot branding, 
just like this, put in a fire, was used on human beings in this United States. And here's why. Slave owners branded slaves because they did not think they were human beings. They were pieces of what? Property. Now, isn't that a sad time to look at it? Property. Can't imagine. Now, quickly to talk about a brand. My wife and I have been married 50 years. Four, four years ago, we decided to come up with a brand. She grew up in the city. I grew up in the country. She didn't know what a brand was. Took out my book, laid it out, and said, these are all the brands, these are the letters, the alphabet, the whole works. And she said, okay, do you have an idea? I said, yeah, my initials M, your initials M, let's make it a double running M. And of course, after 46 years, she says, I don't like it. I said, okay, what are your ideas? She said, well, since there's two M's, let's make a two and you're running M. I said, that's funky. You're not gonna put that on my cap. And then she said, okay, we'll make it you're running M and the number two. And I said, what's the difference? That's still stupid, it's reversed. So we got into a discussion. And finally she said, just hush and let me draw it. I knew, you know, button it up. And she said, this is what she came up with. Well, I said, what's the name? She said, M2. And I thought, oh my God, if she draws that M with that two, I'm gonna go ballistic. <laughs> this is what she drew. She said, here's M. This is your running M. I said, okay. And she said, how do you pronounce the letter T-U? Is it two? She said, that's our brand, M2. Okay, now, I gotta tell you, that's the best idea any city girl could ever come up with out of her mind, okay? But I also want to be honest with you, I've never told her that because I don't want it to go to her head, okay? That's smart thinking. But this is our brand. We have, we've got the brand, we've got them in several different sizes. We use the big brand on the cattle itself. We'll use a small one sometimes if we first got one. But anyway, his brand is there. Now, you're also going to see a 936 on this guy. The man I bought this steer from started a ranch a long time ago. And when he started breeding longhorns, he said, I'm going to start with a number one, and every calf that's born, I'm going to mark one, two, three, four, five, and so on. This is the 936th calf that was born on his property. Okay? So when we bought him, we had to put our brand here on this side, okay? If a third person were to buy it, they have a particular spot that they must put it. Now, how does this guy standing here, what does it have to do with the $60 billion? Okay? The beef industry in the United States is huge. And the reason that it's grown to that point is that these guys right here are the foundation of the beef industry because they were the first ones here. Okay? So, you know, you look at something that started in Spain almost 600 years ago, and we don't know how long they were there and where they came from. But these guys, descendants, blood shows it. So when you see a longhorn, you're looking at a living artifact of Spain, of Mexico, of Texas, and they're all over the U.S. now. Okay, any kind of questions I can answer for you? Yeah? Question? Question? Anybody have a question? I know it always comes up, can we pet him? I wish I could, they love to be petted. Uh, there's a liability issue here that I can't, okay? Uh, I have to tell you a funny story. You know how your teacher tells you, follow the directions? You ever heard that? I had a teacher two weeks ago. 
all the other teachers were coming out and following my directions on how to approach him and pet him, and all these teachers were having their picture taken right up here. Okay, but this one teacher, she's standing over here and says, Oh, that's okay. I've been around cat. I mean, I've been around horses all my whole life. Horse. Now, <laughs> horses kick backwards. Cattle can kick sideways. <laughs> so she walks up there and I said, "Ma'am, ma'am, you understand?" She, that's okay. It's okay. And she pats the big boy on his rump. Well, he did a kaboom, <laughs> and she bounced. Okay, and I want you to know, I got scared. I thought, like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be soon. Are you okay? Are you okay? Yes, 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 yes. And she turned around and walked away. <laughs> and I sat there and said, well, we might as well load up because the attorney's gonna be rolling up here in a minute. And at lunch, this teacher came out on her own and she said, I'd like to apologize to you. And I said, huh? And she said, the thing that makes me the maddest is when I tell my students, follow these directions follow the directions and when they do that they make good great when they don't do that they come up and say why did i get this one wrong okay and she said i just did that and she had just done it she didn't listen to the directions she came up and she got a little rump bump okay so always whether it's in school or any place, if someone's giving you directions, follow them, okay? Miss Trung followed directions today and had her picture taken up here in front, okay? So, I thank you. It's been great being here with you. Just imagine, look around and pick six people besides yourself and think about moving a thousand of these that are wild all the way to Kansas.